you very much. Appreciate it. All right, thank you. Everyone take out your finger. Take out your finger like this. No poking your neighbor. Take out your finger like this. All right. Focus on your finger. 100% attention on your finger. Look at nothing else. Looking at all the scratches, the nicks, the dimples. Looking at 100% attention on your finger. Try to see the color green in your mind. While only looking at your finger, focusing on your finger, try to see the color green in your mind. You can't do it. Your mind does not have picture in picture. It does not have a split screen. Go ahead and put your finger down. There's a few of your personalities that will stay there all day. I know I can do it. I know. I'm an overachiever. I know I can do it. No, what happens is your mind can only focus on one thing at a time. Now, it can randomly and very rapidly go back and forth from idea to idea to idea. But when it has 100% attention, it can only focus on one thing at a time. James Allen, in his epic book, As Man Think, has said, let a man radically alter his thoughts, and he'll be astonished at the rapid transformation of the material conditions of his life. Men think that thoughts can be kept secret. They cannot. They rapidly crystallize into habit, and habit solidifies into circumstance. We are where we are by the thoughts that we hold in our mind, the ones that we focus on the most. Let me illustrate that with a story. Two friends go for a drive. One's, one's name is Alt, uh, Walter, other's Arthur. They go on this dirt, dusty road, and well, Walter's kind of your visionary friend. You know, we all have those guys who think real big, or gals who think real big, and always want to bring you along on some crazy adventure. So they're out here, there's some jackrabbits and some orange trees, and that's about it, a few horses. And Walter says, you know what, I bought all this land right here, and I'm going to build my dream. I've mortgaged everything I got. I'm going to build my dream right here. I want you to buy all the surrounding land, and it's going to double in a year. How many of us have a friend, friends like that? You know, I got this great idea. Just come along. Or, hey, I got my friend. If you get your 10 friends and your 16 friends, it wasn't one of those. But he had this thought, and he said, I've got this vision, this one thought, but I want you to participate. You know, and Arthur was a good friend and encouraged him. I love your dreams. I love your passions. You've had some success and some failures, but congratulations. Now is just not a good time. I just can't afford to do it. Oh, no, you got to do it. You got to do it right now. There's not going to be a better time. I just, right now is not a good time. I, I appreciate it, but, you know, I encourage you. You rah, 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 you keep going. One year later, Walt Disney opened up Disneyland in Anaheim. Art Linkletter had the rights to buy all the property around Disneyland. Interesting enough, he didn't do it. But he was the commentary for the opening day. However, another family from Japan, called the uh, Fuji Sai family, bought the surrounding property for $10,000. Yeah, and in the 90s, sold it back to the Disney Corporation for just under $100 million. Now, what is the difference between the two? The only difference, according to James Allen and also Charles Hanel, the only difference in human behavior is the way that we think. It's not skin color. It's not sex, creed, race, religion. It has nothing to do with that. The only thing that differs one human being from another is the way that they think. Now, Disneyland was not Walt's greatest masterpiece. It was a beautiful thing, and he loved it. It was his first, but his true passion was Disney World. He loved Disney World. Oh, that was his passion. It was his utopia, his society that he wanted to create. But unfortunately, he died by cancer prior to the opening day. Roy, his brother, the more logical side of the team, was there during opening day doing the ceremonies, doing all the interviews. And one newscaster said, isn't it too bad that Walt didn't get to see this? And he choked up. He said, y'all know the story. The only reason why you see it is because Walt saw it first. He had that vision. He had that one idea, that one thought that kept him so centered, so focused, that he could accomplish anything. Now, I just moved from Anaheim to, to Utah, and we would go every single Monday to Disneyland for five years. We'd leave at 3 o'clock. Be there till 9 o'clock, every single Monday. Learning his story, spending time in that park, seeing the kids and grow up there, if you will. I mean, our entire family photo albums is by Mickey or by you. Time. It's, it's pathetic. Like, when my kids get married and they have, like, those wedding videos, they think, were you a prisoner? Because all of the pictures are only at Disneyland. That's the only pictures my kids have. It's pathetic. So now that we've moved here, I'm sure we'll have some new pictures. But the point of the story is the thoughts that we hold in our mind, the relationships that we develop, change our entire world. If you don't have the results you want in your life, you're not asking the right questions. That's all it is. Our minds, our bodies, our souls, our personalities do not change until we ask new questions. One of the biggest questions that will change your life is, will you marry me? Should I have kids? Do you want to have kids? You know, it, those questions, like kind of a, 
I call them a mind shift, if you will. Let's say you're driving down the freeway and there's another belt route exit. You take that exit, it takes you to a whole new world. So those thoughts that we have, those questions that we ask, we take an exit off the norm and create a new environment for us. So I've got two beautiful boys and a little girl and we do what's called daddy's date. And so we go on once a week. So I take my two boys and I said, where do you guys want to go? And this is when we were living in California. And they said, well, we want to go to Mulligan's, which is just like a, one of those puppet golf places, arcades, you know, go-karts. So we go in there, and I grew up in the 80s. I'm a product of the 80s, and so I liked video games growing up. But when I grew up, if you were like me, you you get like maybe a dollar's worth of quarters. That would last you maybe 10 minutes, but it'd take you an hour to ride your bike to the grocery store, and it was kind of the experience. Well, I haven't been in an arcade in 20 years. You go to an arcade now, they're like a little mini Vegas. Like you pay your, play your quarters, and you get these tickets. These tickets, you get TVs and bicycles. And so I walked in, and I see this big screen TV and this mountain bike. I'm like, man, we're going home. This is like Vegas. So when I was younger, I couldn't put two quarters together. But now I'm a little bit older. I got a little bit more money to play some video games. So I commit 80 bucks to the day. So we go there. We spend 80 bucks. We get 400 tickets. I think I'm going home with that big screen TV. You walk in there with those 400 tickets, and you get like the green army, man the hubba bubba stick of gum, and like the inflatable ball. And now I'm pissed. I'm like, 80 bucks, I could have gone to the dollar store and gone to like town. And my boy's like, dad, that was so fun. Now I'm thinking, I can't afford this. This is a waste of my time. So we go home. Next week, dad, dad, can we go back? And now I'm thinking, no, no, we can't. This is a waste of money. You know, it was good once, bad idea second time. So I grab my wife. I said, you know what, sweetheart, come with me. I want to try an experiment. So she goes in with the kids. I'm standing there kind of looking around, seeing, just kind of get a lay of the land. And I see this teenager walking by who works there. And I said, which game spits out the most tickets? Without even flinching, he says, well, that's a spinning wheel, of course. I'm like, take me to it. I want to see it. <laughs> so the spinning wheel is a round dish with numbers on it. You drop your quarter in, dish goes down, hits, goes to the outside. Whatever your quarter sits on, that's the number of tokens you get. He said, now here's the secret. You put five in, and you take up a section of the dish. I'm like, 20 bucks later, I take up the entire dish. I go home with 1,800 tickets. So I'm like stuffed in my pocket. My, I go up to my kids like, Dad, Dad, you won the lottery. And now we get like four army men, like six sticks of gum. And I, I'm done. I'm like, there's no way we're going back. And honestly, we haven't come back since. So what I realized, though, is if you want a different result, you have to ask a different question. I wasn't asking the right questions to get the right amount of tickets the first time. The second time I asked the right question, got the result I wanted. So take a second, and I want you to ponder, I'm going to take a pause here, what questions are you not asking about your business that you need to be asking? So let's take two or three minutes, just ponder for a second. What questions are you not asking for your business, your personal life, or your relationships? What questions are you not asking for your personal life, your relationships, or your business? All right, how many of you, keep writing, don't just kind of, kind of ignore me if you're in the, middle, in the moment of a brilliant thought, but for the rest of you, how many of you have seen uh, or heard of those overnight success stories? <laughs> but I always call them like the 10-year overnight success stories. They busted it, they worked hard, things were crazy, and then all of a sudden they have that overnight success. What's that difference, that gap, if you will? In fact, draw a straight line, then write, draw two diagonal lines, and then a straight line going straight up. So there's a gap, because there's a word I'm going to have you write in the middle of that gap. So a straight line going across, a line, a line, shooting up. In the center of that gap, write the word relationships. I've read over 1,000 biographies. I've interviewed over 2,500 people. I have been fascinated with how people overcome their challenges and obstacles since I was a kid. I dropped out of high school at 16. I was a millionaire at 26 and broke at 27. Then a couple years later, through real estate and investments, I made it all back. But I realized my story was not original. There are countless stories of people who made it, lost it, people who didn't have an education, who didn't have resources, who went on to become household names. How did they do it? It wasn't where they were from. It wasn't their parents. It wasn't their sex, race, religion, creed. None of that. It was the relationships that they formed. You are where you are today by your relationships by your thoughts, and by your relationships. You are exactly where you are today. In fact, let me ask you this. How many of you are in the profession you are in because of either a mentor, a friend, a parent's you know, friend growing up? Show of hands. Let's see. How many of you are in the profession you are in because of a relationship of some sort? Maybe a friend took you to college. Maybe they inspired you to get in the profession you're in. Almost all of you. 
We are where we are based off our relationships. There's two types of relationships. There's relationships to riches, and there's relationships to ruin. If you look at the word riches, I like to define words. I like to look them up in the dictionary. Riches is defined as resources. So it's relationships to resources. Relationships to ruin are the ones that take you down. There's one question, absolutely one question, that will rock your world more than any other question. I said, let me rephrase that. There's one question that will rock your business more than any other question I know. And it's the question I've asked myself for about 15 years. And it's very simple, but write this one down. What is the craziest thing I can do for my business today? Now, that sounds kind of silly, but what is the craziest thing I can do for my business? What's the craziest, most bizarre thing you could positively do for your business? I had this idea one day. I sit in my office. You know, I've done the books, and I did all these other things. And I thought, I've never made a movie. Now, I'm a high school dropout and a college dropout. I've dropped out of everything in my life except my marriage. So I am professional at dropping out. But I thought, I've never done a movie. I want to do a movie. So I sat there and figured, well, how do you do a movie? So I Googled, how do you do a movie? And I started reading and learning. I found that when you do a movie, you need what's called B-roll. So when you watch a movie, they've got that aerial shot of New York, or they got the sunset by the beach. That's called B-roll. It's kind of a filler, if you will, between your content. So there are companies in the industry that film that for you, but they're very expensive. You know, this is back in, eight, in 2008. A 20-second shot HD ran anywhere from $600 to $900. Well, to do this movie I wanted, there was about 200 shots of B-roll I needed. So I found the greatest company in Hollywood that did it, called them up, and I said, who here in your company uh, is in charge of your B-roll department? I said, oh, that's Susie. I said, okay, thank you very much. Hung up the phone. Called up 1-800-Flowers. I need flowers and chocolate sent to Susie at this address. And on the card, I said, thank you in advance for helping with my movie, Woody Woodward, and my cell number. Three days later, I get a phone call. Who are you, and why are there flowers on my desk? Susie, thanks so much for calling. I was looking forward to your call. What I'm doing is, and I went on to tell her I'm going to do this movie about my platform. It's called Your Emotional Fingerprint. It's what makes people feel successful or fail. And I said, I'm doing this great movie. We're going to present it to the United Nations. We've got this documentary going on. It's going to be phenomenal. But I need you to donate your B-roll to my movie. And she said, you realize we're a business, right? Like, we actually make money, and that's how we afford these clips. I said, yeah, I understand. But you got to understand what I'm doing is I'm going to change the world, and I need your help to do it. Well, you don't understand. We're in so we go back and forth like four times. And I wasn't going to back down because I had nothing to lose. And she said, no one hung up. So what? It was, you know, 50 bucks in flowers. Big deal. So I got her down to the point where she's like, all right, it's like, okay, it's kind of an interesting idea. I kind of like where you're going with this. Um, but I need to talk to my CEO and then get back to you. I said, no problem. So I hung up, called her office, and what's the name of the CEO? Mm -hmm. Send her flowers and chocolates and <laughs> get a call back. And they said, okay, here's the deal. For the next 30 days, you write down every clip you want. You write down where it's going to go in your movie. You give us the script. You give us everything that you are going to use our footage for for your movie. And I said, oh, no problem. I'll send that to you immediately. Don't have any of it done. Like, I, haven't, I, mean, I can't write. I can't spell. I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to write a script. I'm like, sure, no problem. I'll send that right over. So I'm up for three days straight, you know, just shooting the caffeine to stay awake. And send it over to them. And then at day 15, this is when Hollywood Video exists. Can you believe that? I went to Hollywood Video, got a gift card and a bucket of popcorn and some chocolates and sent it to both of them and said, thank you and enjoy a movie on me. Day 30, flowers again. And then I get a phone call from them. All right, Woody, here's the deal. We are a business, therefore we can't donate it for free, but here's what we are willing to do for you. We are willing to give you as much footage as you want at $50 a clip. Thank you. Credit card down. Let's go to town. We went. We were able to produce a multi-million dollar movie for a fraction of the cost because I asked the simple question, what is the craziest thing I can do for my business? That one decision set my life in a whole new order. That's where I actually met Garrett Gunderson. The reason I'm standing here today is because of Garrett's relationship I had with him. I put him in the movie. I put about 25 other amazing people that I met and I you know, knew from my mastermind group along the way. The movie went on to become very successful. It was, won a couple awards and it got picked up in German, it got picked up in French, and then that led to a bo another book deal, and that book deal led to another infomercial. Had I stayed in that same rut, the only difference between a rut and a grave is the depth of the hole. <laughs> That's it. But to get out of that rut, you have to ask a new question. So that question is, What's the craziest thing I can do for my business? Now, you can apply it to your personal life. You can apply it to your relationship. What's the craziest thing I can do for my personal life? How many of you have ever ran a marathon? Anyone ever ran a marathon? You guys are all crazy. 
<laughs> Seriously. Like, I have asthma going up the stairs is hard enough. 26 miles, I don't even like driving 26 miles. I'm not putting my shoes on for that length of time. There's no way. I've got a sister-in-law who does it. I think she's nuts. But you are crazy. The definition of crazy is wildly excited. What are you wildly excited about? In your relationships, what's the craziest thing you can do for your relationships? What can you do to rock the world of your spouse, your lover, your partner, your child, your friend, your coworker, your boss, your employees, your customers? What can you do to rock their world? This is where relationships to riches and relationships to ruin come into play. Take a second, and I want you to think of that one individual who had the greatest impact in your life. Write their name down on this piece of paper. Top of your notes, write their name down. It could be mom, dad, sibling, uh, school teacher, uh, maybe it was your first friend, whoever it was, write their name down. Because as we go through the rest of the seminar, I want you to think of their name. I want you to mentally give gratitude for them, for who they are, what they've done, and the influence they've had on your life. Because as I talk about relationships to riches, and I talk about relationships to ruin, you're going to see an enormous divide between the two. Those people who've lifted you, built you up, cared for you, taken care of you, that's relationships to riches. That's resources. It's not about the money. It's about the difference that they make. And you have done the same for other people. So just ponder for a second. Who is that one individual who changed your life? And if you're, just give gratitude in your heart real quick for them because they made you who you are or at least influenced you a little bit to who you are today. There was a lovely woman named Jean Nidatech. She was very heavy, overweight, always struggled with her weight, married a husband who was very overweight, and that's kind of what they had in common. They would eat a lot, and that's just their bond that they had. Well, one day, Jean decided, you know what? I'm sick of being fat. I'm sick of being overweight. I want to do something different with my life. That question, can I do it? You know, she's been up and down on diets her entire life, but can I do it? Is it possible? She was living in New York, and so she went to the Department of Health in New York and said, give me some tools. What information do you have about health that I could learn about? She got six of her friends together and said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to meet every single week. We're going to weigh ourselves. We're going to be a support group. We're going to work together. What happened is those six turned into 12, 18, 24, 36 to 40, to the point where they all couldn't fit in her tiny little apartment <laughs> anymore, and they had to go get a larger facility, meaning the YMCA. And then one day, a man came along and said, you know what? If you can help me and my wife lose weight, I'll help you take this concept nationally. All right, yeah, no problem. I, can, I mean, we were helping, she lost 67 pounds and kept it off. She's like, yeah, absolutely, I can help you do that, no problem. She helps him and his wife in one year lose 56 pounds. Together, they formed Weight Watchers. Change the world has done more for health than any other diet program on the planet. Relationships to riches is, is that's what that's defined as. It's resources, helping people achieve goals, their dreams, their passions. As you do that, you get rewarded. She went from this tiny little apartment to how many, I mean, tens of thousands of franchises around the world. Take another man, Richard Branson. Great guy, very passionate. I mean, if you've ever read his book, or haven't read his book, go get it. It's amazing, because you talk about someone who's asked new questions all the time, someone who want to know, could it be done? He is that man. Well, one day, he was ready, to, he had Virgin Records, and he's going to go launch this brand new band. They've all agreed on everything, the terms are set, so they decide to go have a celebratory dinner, and it was in the 70s, and they're at a restaurant that Rich would always eat at. And so, the, uh, and this is in Europe, and the chef brought out, after dinner and after desserts, brought out a platter of marijuana joints. And in his book, he talks about, well, you know what, it was the 70s, we all thought we'd smoke them, so they all did. The next day, that band called and canceled the contract. Would not sign it, because they thought he was trying to drug them to get them to sign it. That band became extremely successful. It was Dire Straits. He realized it cost his company over $500 million dollars and multi, multi Grammys. Relationships to ruin. You have people in your life, by choice or by accident, that are bringing you down, that are ruining your business, that are ruining your life, and also ruining your relationships. Take a mental inventory. Who is that one person or that one group? Or maybe it's that one website that you go on to too often. 
Maybe it's that one social networking site that you go on too often that is negatively affecting your business and your relationships. Now write that name down. Take a second, ponder it for yourself. What business, what relationship, what are you doing inadvertently, accidentally, or intentionally that is ruining your potential for success? I've developed two platforms. One's called Your Emotional Fingerprint and one's called Relationships to Riches. What I found with the Emotional Fingerprint is everybody has seven characteristics that uniquely makes them feel important. It governs whether you feel happy, whether you feel sad, whether you feel on top of the world, or whether you feel down, and how you can control it internally. See, most self-help, most great books that are out there, great platforms, all whack at the branches. They never go to the root. Your emotional finger is your root. When you feed that internally, your tree explodes. Your life blossoms. When I read the thousand biographies, I realized the reason why people were over, able to overcome incredible obstacles and beat unbeatable odds is they were driven from the inside out. As crazy as Steve Jobs was at his pinnacle, would you all agree that he was driven from the inside out? Would you agree, uh, say, um, Henry Ford, Walt Disney, Mother Teresa, Gandhi, driven from the inside out? Doesn't matter which level of success they have, they're driven from the inside out, and that is your emotional fingerprint. Uh, if you want more information on that, you can go to nomoretherapy.com. I don't believe in therapy, I believe in strategy. Therapy means treatment, strategy means results. So nomoretherapy.com, you can discover your own emotional fingerprint. The second platform I created is called Relationships to Riches. And in that process, I found there are five currencies. Everybody has five currencies. So write these down because we're going to talk about them. You have mental currency, emotional currency, physical currency, spiritual currency, financial currency. So mental, emotional, physical, spiritual, financial. The way I discovered this is I had a client come to my house. I charged a ridiculous amount of money for one-on-one -on -one coaching. And he, this gentleman has coached with me. He comes to my house. He's like, Woody, I'm so furious. He had made a fortune in the real estate market in California. And in 2008, 2009, he's losing everything. Just can't stand it. He's like, I'm depressed, I'm worried. And so we talked about his emotional fingerprint. We talked about validating internally. And he had no hope. Have you ever been in that moment where you have no hope? You're exhausted. I mean, if, you're, if you've lived longer than 10 years, you've had a moment like that. And he was at that pinnacle part. And I said, okay, what do you have? Well, he's a good looking, meaning he had a physical currency. He could stand up, he could walk, he wasn't disabled. He had a physical currency. And he had a phenomenal mental currency. Wicked smart, just sharp, bright, could do things just could deliver a message to the masses. Within less than 30 days, we helped him and showed him how he could take that currency and exchange it in the marketplace to create a revenue source for he and his family. And in less than 30 days, he went from zero to $40,000 a month. If you look at the word currency, currency means to exchange. That's all currency is. It does not take money to make money. It takes currency. You need to exchange something to get something. So there's five steps I'm going to walk you through. So step one is to rate your currency. Of those five currencies, what is your strongest currency? What do you have the most of? So is it mental? Is it emotional? Is it spiritual, physical, or financial? My background is in emotional. I've studied and I've interviewed and I've walked people through amazing tragedies in their life. So my strongest currency is emotional. Well, what do I do with that? I exchange that for a living. I write books, I do movies, I do talks, I do seminars. So it doesn't matter which your currency is, you can exchange it for whatever you want. Step two is what is your why? What is your why? You can endure any amount of how if you know your why. And I apologize for most of you who are only gonna get half of what I say because I speak ridiculously fast and I blend all my words together. So I do apologize in advance for that. But you have to know your why. A lot of times people come to me and say, oh, Woody, I want to make more money. Why do you want to make more money? Well, I want to spend more time with my kids. Why do you want to spend more time with your kids? Well, because I don't spend as much time with them. They're getting older. But why? Well, they're 16 and 17 years old. They're going to be graduating soon. They're going to be out of the house. So why do you want to spend time with them? Because I'm going to lose them in a year and a half. So what you really want is you want to spend quality time with your children. That does not take money. We all believe that money is an association to solving our problems. Now, I've been rich and I've been broken. Yes, being rich is better than being broke. 
But it does not make you happy. It does not create more opportunity for you per se. It just takes a little edge off on if you can buy groceries that day or not. That's all it does. So when you go down at least five whys, why, 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 you'll get to your true why. Now, step three is who has what you want? Who has what you want? What book, what website, what guru, what author, what friend has what you want? Then you need to go out and exchange with them. I have made most of my revenue for my company in what I call the interview process. It cost me on average maybe $23.96. I interview people, I take them to lunch, I pay for their lunch, I learn about what their needs are, where they're going, what passions they have in life, and then in return, after I've created value for them, if I need something from them after I understand what they have and who they are and what they want, I will then ask for it. I never ask first, because if you do, you lose. I charge $10,000 for 10 hours of my coaching, it's 10 grand up front. It's a ridiculous amount of money. I totally get that. Nobody's worth $1,000 an hour. But if I'm going to take time away from my family, if I'm going to leave my family, that's what my time's worth to me. I have never had a problem getting a client because I interview the right qualified people. You get the right qualified people, you can make any amount of money you want to make. Then the benefit to charging $1,000 an hour is you're able to donate an enormous amount of time to people who can't afford it. I would say probably 60% of my day is helping people who can't afford it. But because I charge enough, it compensates my time. So when you know what your passion is, your life's vision, your life's dream, your life's work, charge for it because you're worth it. You have an innate ability, skill set that nobody on this planet has. You have a story that nobody else has. You have experiences that nobody else has. When I dropped out of high school, statistically my life was over. If you've ever had friends who've dropped out of high school or read about people who've dropped out of high school, they spiral pretty quick. Life is pretty much over. They get put into a category of not even getting their GED and barely getting a job at McDonald's. That is where I was headed. Until one day, a relationship saved me. I was the youngest of five. I was a troubled teen. I had some other siblings who were troubled. My parents were doing the best they could with the information that they had, and they were exhausted. We burned them out. One day, my older sister came home from college, physically grabbed me by my ankles, dropped me to the floor, because it was one o'clock in the afternoon and I was still asleep, said, get your blankety blank on and let's go. She was older than I was, she was bigger than I was, so I followed her to the car. She drove me to the alternative school and enrolled me in school. Now this alternative school, I'm not, has anyone ever gone to an alternative school? Okay, the alternative schools are, you can smoke as long as you don't smoke next to the pregnant girls. And that was the rule of the school. <laughs> you can't smoke in class, but you can smoke outside as long as you don't smoke next to the pregnant girls. That's the only rule. That's the environment I started in my high school. All of a sudden, one day hit, and I looked around and thought, well, how did I get here? Like, how did I end up here? Have you ever had that moment? You wake up one day like, what the blankety blank happened to my life? How am I here? And I thought, I don't want to be here anymore. That question, can I change? Can I make a difference? Can I change my life? You want a question that will <laughs> change your life? Ask that one. Can it be done? Can I change my life? Your past does not equal your future. If you think it does, I can give you a thousand biographies of men and women on every continent who've overcome their past, overcome their environment. So I thought the only way out was through work. Like Winston Churchill's quote, if you're going through hell, keep on going. So I buckled down and I kept on going. Took summer school, came to my senior year and I didn't have enough credits to graduate. I had to go to school at six in the morning to get a credit. School started from seven to two. I had to go to night school from two to five and I had to work from five to 9.30 to get a work credit. It got to the point where I was so exhausted that my mom was helping me with my homework and I'll never forget our Ben Franklin uh, report. I turned it in in her handwriting. I was so exhausted, I could not transcribe it. And so my teacher wrote A on it and said, either tell your mom or your girlfriend she did a good job. <laughs> and I passed that English class. And it came down about 30 days before graduation was over. Or I'm sorry, before graduation started. And we're sitting on this bench, I'll never forget, 12 
of us. I grew up in the same house my entire life. I got kicked out of two middle schools, so those two middle schools fed in the high school. So I knew everybody. And I'm sitting on this bench, 12 of us. Every one of my friends got up to get an award, either academically or through sports. And I'm sitting there, and I'm looking, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, I remember you in the third grade, the fifth grade, the seventh grade. We went teeping that one night. I saw you get drunk, and we were going back and forth. I'm thinking, how in the world did I end up where I am? Every one of those other 11 got an award. And I thought to myself, if I graduate, all bets are off. If I walk across that stage, we're even again. And I can do anything I want with my life. And I hustled, and I worked, and I bled trying to figure out how to graduate. Came down to my history teacher. Last day, I stayed for 24 hours studying for the test. And he said, if you pass this test, you graduate. We didn't order a cap and gown. We by far didn't do senior pictures. We didn't even tell anybody. Came down to that last test. Stayed up 24 hours. I turned it in. Sixth period. Takes a look at it. Throws it in the garbage. I lose it. I start screaming. I start cussing. How dare you son of a... He said, Woody, if I grade it and there's one mistake on it, you don't graduate. Go graduate. I remember running out of that room. I left my backpack, my jacket, raced to the payphone, called my mom at work. You won't believe I'm graduating. That night, I had to borrow a cap and gown by, from someone who already went through the line to cross that <laughs> stage. My, <laughs> this is a true story. My principal frisked me to make sure I wasn't going to pull any pranks as I went across that stage and got a standing ovation from my friends, those relationships, those people who bear you up, who hold you in a safe spot at times. And after graduation, all my friends went to Hawaii. And I borrowed $500 from my parents. I was 17 years old and had my mom co-sign on my first business license. And I've been self-employed ever since. I have traveled the world. I've had products sell at Walmart, Kmart, Toys R Us, QVC. I've done the three infomercials, the nine books, the three movies. And I say that not from a look at me, other than if I can do it, anybody can do it. I could not read until I was 19 years old. I ended up going to a community college and getting tested because I wanted to know how to read. And they, they tested me to fifth grade reading comprehension. I remember one time my friend and I were uh, going to do a triathlon. And I remember reading it. And I asked him, I said, what's a metal lion? We get a, what, a metal lion? It was a medallion. 18 years old and can't read medallion. And I learned one very, very valuable principle. If you work hard, if you humble yourself and you beg for mercy at times, you can overcome anything. You can drive harder, work smarter, build relationships that change the human race. You can change the world. Because if you've ever read a biography of anyone who's ever changed the world, that's that same recipe that they did. No one has ever changed the world who had it easy. Not one. They don't write stories about people like that because they don't exist. It's the person who's been raped, molested, dropped out, divorced, kicked to the curb, can't read, dyslexia, whatever it is, because they overcome. That's that internal part of emotional fingerprint that I refer to. When you drive yourself from the inside out, you control the outcome of your life. You control the outcome of your business and your relationships. When I had graduated, there was a man, I, I've always believed in volunteering, I've always believed in giving back, so I decided to volunteer at a local uh, scout troop. And I met this man who was one of my first mentors. How many of you have ever had a mentor in your life? How many of you have ever been a mentor to somebody else? Best feeling on the planet, to be able to give back. He was my first mentor. I remember he pulled up one day in a 300 CX. I'm like, oh my gosh, what an amazing car. I said, will you take me for a drive? He said, no, I won't take you for a drive, but I'll let you drive it. Threw me the keys and he got in the passenger seat. Now, I was irresponsible. I'm driving 130 miles an hour. I didn't even think to ask him if I could, but I just want to see how fast that car could go. <laughs> and I was like, Woo! I'm down I-5. We're racing to Canada. We're missing exits. He's like, you know, we got to turn around and get back to the scout troop. I didn't even care. I'm going to Canada. We're flying. So we turned around. But what happened was, is he helped me get my first t-shirts to design and to sell. And I don't know if you guys have ever seen the, the clothing store Zoomies, but they started in my hometown. I sold my first idea to Zoomies when they only had six stores. And I didn't even know what a PO was. He's like, yeah, you got a PO? I'm like, uh, I don't have a PO. 
He's like, no, a P.O., purchase order. I, mean, I don't even know what that is. So he wrote it. I never even turned it into him. I still have it framed at home. He still owes me 16 bucks. And a compounding interest, that should be right around 150. And so I realized that by relating with people, connecting with people, opportunities change. Well, I got into the toy industry, worked for Etch-a-Sketch Company, designed toys that sold around the world, and then I met two business par partners, once again, the relationship cycle. They, during the whole dot-com, dot-bomb, we were taking our company public. <laughs> I had sold my shares to them. They went through the dot-bomb. The re effect was on me that I went through the dot-bomb because they couldn't pay me. But before then, when we had a little bit of resources, we took my mom and dad to go to Ireland. And on the way to Ireland, the, we missed the flight, and we ended, up, we ended up in New York City. So we're at New York City, and I thought, well, let's go to a Broadway play. I love the arts and theater. So we go to um, this Broadway show. I'm sitting down. My mentor sits down right in front of me. And I grew up in Seattle. I have not seen him in 10 years. He has no idea of the success I've had. He was just a nice guy. We knew each other for six, seven months. We went our separate ways. He was actually the vice president of Costco for clothing. And that's how he had the connections to the t-shirts. I was able to take him out to the alley and talk to him about how he blessed my life. Had a very precious moment there. I haven't seen him since. But to say, you changed my life. You gave me a leg up when nobody would. I mean, I had a mohawk. It was nine inches high. It was pink. I had a tail. I mean, what, why would you invest in a kid like that? I mean, seriously. Statistically, I should have been in jail. I had many friends who were. And he stepped in. That one intervention, that one relationship changed my life. From there, I can't even count how many people have changed my life, those relationships. I was actually in Denver last night. And... Uh, Excuse me. <clears throat> I was invited to go be part of an organization that is going to take a leadership program through the universities. They love the relationship to riches concept. They love the emotional fingerprint concept. I volunteered once again just to give my time. I said, let me come. I'll just show you what I know. I'll help you write your curriculum. I don't want anything in return. We're sitting around this conference room. And I had stayed up the night before with two women and walk them through their emotional fingerprint. It changed the way that they saw their kids, their spouse, their businesses, their grandkids. That, that following day, last night, when it came to discussion, what should we do for the life plan of the course, both women stood up and fought for me to use emotional fingerprint. I didn't say a single word. Because their lives had been changed, they were investing in my concepts and ideas. Now, we start our pilot session in January. It's being accredited by Harvard. It's being accredited by local universities. High school dropout, can't read, creates an information, is now being taught at a university. Never would have happened without relationships. I am just not that cool. <laughs> I'm not. But because you invest in other people, because you give back, because you share who you are. See, your stories and your experiences are not for you alone. Your stories, your life experience is to give to the world. Let me ask you this. My personal story that I just shared with you, did it touch you or move you in any way, shape, or form? And I don't see that, say that from an egotistical standpoint. I say that as proof that when you share, other people's lives change. So when it comes to relationships to riches, step three, when you interview other people, when you build value for them, and then in return ask them what you can do for them, you're putting emotional deposits into their account. When you need a withdrawal, you can make that phone call. Step four is the exchange rate. There are, yes, question. Yeah, let me go through one, two, three, and again, so we went on a side note. So step one is rate your currency. What is your most dominant currency? Rate them one through five. What's your strongest currency? Number two is what is your why? Go down five steps. Why, why, why? Why do you want that? Why are you in the profession you're in? Why are you married? Why are you a grandparent? Why are you a parent? Why, why, why? Step three is, the, I call it, you know, who has what you want theory. I mean, who has it? Go get it. You know, if you want, if you want wood, go to Home Depot. If you want a book, go to Barnes & Noble. If you need money, go to a bank or a VC. Find whoever has what you want. Step four is the exchange rate. 
there are three principles to the exchange rate. Principle one, no one currency is more valuable than another. Okay? Financial currency is not more valuable than physical currency. If you're a billionaire on your deathbed, you'd give everything you have for that physical currency. Step two, any one currency can be exchanged for another currency. You can change emotional currency for a spiritual currency, for a mental currency, for a financial currency. Step three, any one currency can be exchanged for whatever it is you want. Doesn't take money to make money. Oh, thank you. Thank you for slowing me down. Appreciate that. Yeah. So step three is you can exchange any currency you have for whatever it is you want. So I'll go through again. Number one is no one currency is more valuable than another. Step two is you can exchange any one currency for another currency. And step uh, three is you can exchange any one currency for whatever it is you want. So after you've interviewed somebody and they, they tell you what they want, look at your strongest currency. Can you help them achieve that goal? Can you help them get what they want with your currency? If you can, it's a win-win. Then the conversation starts, well, what can I do for you? How can I help you? By doing that, you are then able to create massive currency exchange and value. And step five, or principle five, is compound interest. Albert Einstein was asked, what is the greatest power in the universe? And he said, compound interest. Compound interest is taking $1,000, investing it, getting $150 on top of that, taking that $1,000, that $150, and reinvesting it again and again. So you're compounding your principal and your interest. So look at your five currencies. Where are you the weakest in it? Is it emotional currency? Is it spiritual currency? If you invest in that currency and reinvest in that currency, that currency goes through the roof. And that's how you create wealth and value. If you want, I have a whole card system on this. You go to myemotionalfingerprint.com, myemotionalfingerprint.com on the products. There's a card system. And I wish I had enough to give you all one, but I just don't. Um, this is what you're looking for. Relationships to riches powered by your emotional fingerprint. See, here's what happens is when you are internal with your emotional fingerprint, your currencies go through the roof. How many of you have met people who are what I call external? They're takers. They want, they want to take from you. They never contribute. That's external. We live in an external environment. Our marriages are external. Our religions are external. Our universities are external. So we have to learn and train ourselves how to be back internal. When you do that, your currencies go through the roof. I came here today not selling anything. I called Garrett up. I heard he has having an event. I said, hey, how can I create value for you? Do you want a mindset guy? Do you want someone to come and, and share mindsets? He's like, yeah, come on down. I'm not selling anything. I'm not doing anything other than trying to create value internally. Because there'll be some of you here in the room, it will resonate with. You will then go to nomoretherapy.com or myemotionalfingerprint.com. You'll study. You might learn something new. That's all I care about. Share and give. As you do that, you will revolutionize your relationships. Is that a CD or a DVD? It's an instructional DVD with two decks of cards. After doing the ninth book, I thought, I'm not writing a tenth book. There's no way I'm doing it. So my background being in toys, I thought, how do I take a 300-page book and make it fun? So I made it into a deck of cards. It's 52 decks, or 52 cards in a deck. So you sit down, you play out your emotional fingerprint. You lay out all five currencies. You then flip the currency cards over, and it tells you what you can do to increase the value of those currencies. You take your emotional fingerprint you laid out. You flip that over when you're feeling down and depressed. It tells you what you can do for you, by you, to get back being internal. And as you do that, you create massive value in the marketplace. So in closing, have a dream bigger than your fear. Pick a dream that wakes you up at night, that scares you to death, that if you were to achieve it, it would blow your mind. That's the kind of dream you need to have. And share it with people. Let your friends laugh, because that's the motivation you're going to need to blow past them. I'll never get my high school reunion at 10 years I went back. And that's right when I had made it and lost it. So they all knew I had made it. They all knew I had lost it. And I remember going back, and I had to borrow money and airline tickets to get there. It was horrible. And I walked in there, and most of my friends had not moved outside of a five-mile radius from home. They were all drinking and living at the same bars that their parents were. I, at that point, had traveled the world, had products sell at Walmart, Kmart, Toys R Us. 
And I'm not saying that, that my life was better than theirs, but my life was lived. And when this is all over, you're going to want to be on your deathbed saying, man, I lived. I made a difference in my life, and I made a difference in the lives of others. Because in my opinion, that is why we're here. Thank you for your time. I appreciate you spending it with me. Thank you. <laughs>